Well, folks, Sony have done it again. Another one. The age of Global Shutter has begun. Another one. Look, Global Shutter was always going to come here eventually, and smart money would have had it being on Sony to bring this to the market first. As I put in my cars and cameras video, where I was analyzing which camera company equals which car company, I think Sony is the Tesla of the camera industry. They're innovators, they're pioneers, they're early adopters. They lead, and a couple of years later, the more traditional manufacturers follow, and it just makes sense that they would take this huge leap into global shutters. Now, mark my words, whilst I think there are some considerations we need to talk about in this video, there's some great benefits that I don't think have had a whole lot of coverage and some reality checks that need to be included as well. This isn't the first global shutter camera out there. We've had the Red Komodo for some time, as well as the Zcam, and it's not the first full-frame global shutter sensor. Canon developed one almost a year ago, but in terms of this part of the market, a full-frame global shutter actual camera hitting the market, then this is definitely going to make some waves. So in this video, I'm going to talk you through the top line specs and that kind of thing, as well as the things that I think are the main benefits of this, as well as some reality checks where I think, and this is rare for Sony, that this is actually going to be quite a niche product where the number of people who will actually get benefit from what it's bringing to the table is quite small. And given the big price jump, you're really gonna to have to think this through before just plonking down your money. First off, I have to apologize. This is not a stage set, obviously. I am running around like crazy trying to get ready for a work trip to Japan that I'm going out on tomorrow. It's really exciting and I'm looking forward to share that with you. And I am taking like a dozen flashes with me, so it's a nice time to be talking about global shutter, actually. Now, first of all, what is a global shutter? So a traditional shutter, well, a traditional sensor, I should say, when it's reading the data or it's kind of capturing the image and writing the data, it does it line by line. So if you've got a camera that's like 8,000 by 5,000, whatever, it has to write each one of those lines sequentially. And that means that as, you know, LED lights are flickering or as the sensor's moving, that kind of thing, that's how you can get the flicker and that's how you can get warping into your shot. And that's also why we have a maximum sync speed based on our mechanical shutter and the sensor's readout speed. So something like the Z9 has an incredibly fast readout speed of around 1 250th of a second, which means it doesn't have a mechanical shutter anymore and it just uses the electronic shutter. A global shutter, on the other hand, takes a snapshot of the entire sensor at once, boom, and just grabs it off. This is really remarkable, and it is something that I've been looking forward to seeing come to the market in a mainstream way for decades, or at least a decade. And for that reason, I think the A93 is a really important camera. So the first top line things that I think we should be really focusing on here the, you know, every company does this, this isn't a Sony thing, every company loves a good marketing headline, so things like it can sync up to 1 80,000th of a second makes for a great headline, but as I'll explain later, I think that's useless for almost everyone. What is potentially useful, maybe not in that camera, but in cameras that will follow, is the ability to get rid of banding and to not have an issue with the frequency of lights. That is something that's going to be really, really helpful. Let's go through the main positives as I see them from this camera, looking at the specification. So 120 frames per second burst mode in RAW is insane. Now, apparently that's with full autofocus. I don't know if it's in, you know, uncompressed full 14 bit RAW or if there's some limitations on that, but in any case, it's insane, and I'm not one of those people who's gonna say, do we really need it? I would say going from 20 to 30 or 30 to 50, there are diminishing returns in those increments. So going from 50 to 120, it's really cool. And occasionally I've shot this does 120 frames per second, but only in JPEG. Occasionally I've done it for, in the two years I've owned that maybe twice or three times I've actually wanted it rather than I'm just doing it for testing sake, like when an archer was about to release an arrow, that kind of thing. 
then it's really, really cool. So having that capability is insane and it is going to shake things up and we'll probably find new ways that we can use that kind of technology. But I would suggest there's not that many people who are actually going to be shooting anything on the regular that are actually going to get benefit from that. Please leave me your comments, I'm sure. Something like this that I believe is a really niche product is going to get polarizing comments, although Sony does that anyway when I'm on my videos. So you'll find the people who do have a use case for this who are so vocal about it, and then those who don't and don't foresee themselves ever having a use for it, just saying that it's stupid. There's a middle ground, and more importantly, I think is what this heralds for future generations. So getting to that 180,000th thing, why is that important? So if you, well, there's something you need to think about when you're shooting flash, you have your camera shutter speed and you have essentially a second shutter speed that's introduced by your flash duration. So when people, you know, I shoot with Hasselblad, it has a leaf shutter. So if the lens can, uh, has a leaf shutter that will go up to say one four thousandth of a second, you can sync at any shutter speed up to that and it will work fine. Whereas, you know, with the Z9, it's one two fiftieth. With something like a Fujifilm GFX camera, it's one one hundred and twenty fifth. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, you can always just switch to high speed sync. It's not the same. If you're using high speed sync, it does a whole series of little bursts, basically dragging the flash longer. And the amount, the intensity of light you get at any one point is much lower. So you can't take advantage of the full power of the flash. So if you're shooting and trying to get, say, one four thousandth of a second to be able to kill the ambient and then use your flash to bring it back in, you have to think about that because you need a lot of flash power to get there. So one eighty thousandth of a second, if you were doing extreme like dust or water drop or something with crazy amounts of fluid mo motion, you can find that you can actually use a slower shutter speed on your camera, but if your flash duration is fast enough and it's the only light source in the scene, it can do the job of freezing the action for you. But, and this is a, a serious but, there's a couple of things here. There's hardly any flashes out there that can discharge much power in that kind of time frame. The only flash that I know of that really can discharge in an 80,000th of a second is the Profoto Pro 11, and the power pack for that is $17,500 before you buy cables or heads or bulbs. So you're talking like $25,000 for that flash setup, and at 180,000th of a second discharge, you're getting about 1,000th of the power output. If you wanna to get to say uh, an eighth power, then you need to drop your shutter speed back to eight thousandth of a second. Still pretty impressive. And if you wanna shoot half power on that guy, then you need to be back down at one fifteen hundredth of a second. So just keep in mind for whilst that sounds great on paper, one eighty thousandth of a second, the rules of exposure still apply. So you still have to balance out that insane shutter speed with aperture and have sufficient depth of field. There's no point shooting water drops at f0.5 because nothing's gonna be in focus anyway. So you're probably gonna be at f4 or f8 anyway. And then you're going to need either insane amount of flash, which you just can't get at that shutter speed, or have your ISO crazy high. So keep that in mind. Looking through the specs, I threw up the current generation on b &H Photo, the A7 IV, the A7R5, the A1, and now the A93, taking a look at how they differentiated. One thing that jumped out, the, a, the new one, the A93, has a base ISO of 250, up to 25,600 or expandable to 51,200. That's a much narrower band than the other cameras, especially for low res sensors. Um, so I do wonder, and I'm not being a hater, I haven't tested it, I haven't seen any test results on this, but I do wonder what the effect of the global shutter is going to mean for the dynamic range of a sensor like this. Also, I noticed that the metering range is minus five to plus 17, whereas all the other cameras were up to plus 20. Um, it's the same viewfinder, same card configuration, and same body size and weight as A7R5 and the A1. 
Of course, the A74 only has the one CF Express A and one SD, but otherwise pretty much the same as well. The A93, I guess the global shutter drawing that image instantly takes a lot more juice because the battery life is significantly lower despite using the same battery as all the others. So it's getting 400 shots rating compared to 520 on the A7 IV. Um, this could be a plus or a minus. The screen type that it has being the fully articulating type, um, I, I've realized from my videos on the Nikon ZF that that's really polarizing for people. Some people see it as a vlogging style screen and find it really annoying. So I wonder if there'll be that kind of intense debate on this camera, which is obviously intended to be kind of a sports camera, um, how they're going to find that kind of a screen. The other thing is, it is only 24 megapixel. So, you know, the marketing material says like 24.5 or 0.8 or whatever, but it's a 6,000 by 4,000 image. It's a 24 megapixel camera. Um, yes, I mean, given the speed and all of the things it's doing, I'm not saying that that's unreasonable. And as a first generation of global shutter, I think it's actually fantastic. But one, is that going to do it for your work? And it just makes it further niche. For example, if you were buying it for that incredible flash sync, well, a lot of people who are doing portraiture, for example, opt for the high-res camera in the range. So if it's Sony, it's the R5. If it's Nikon, it's the Z8 or 9. Or go for a Hasselblad or a Fuji for a medium format to get you know really high resolution. So 24 megapixel, if what your main purpose is, is portraiture, makes it niche. If you're getting it for sports or water drops, then again, does the difference going from an A1 at a much higher resolution at a fast speed, an incredibly fast speed, to going to half the resolution with a ridiculously fast speed, does that trade-off actually work for you? And I can't wait to get one in to test out. I'm really hoping that I can re-establish re a relationship with Sony here in Hong Kong. They just don't return my calls, unfortunately, so I've put in a request from b and Photo to get one of these to test out. My biggest thought is, is how's the buffer going to be? Because these are using CF Express Type A cards, which are half the speed of the CF Express Type B that a lot of other brands are using these days. So doing up to 120 frames per second raw, how long is that going to last and then how long are you going to be locked out of the camera? I've found in the past on Sony cameras when they're riding, often you're completely locked out, not just unable to take more photos, but you're just kind of unable to do anything. So it'll be interesting to see how they've managed that. Hopefully they've stuffed in a gigantic buffer that can really handle that, that's super quick. The other thing is it's $6,000. Again, making it a niche product, it's only $500 behind the flagship A1 now, a significant bump over the A9 Mark II. So that raises a couple of questions. It's such a hard decision now between a higher res super speed A1 or a lower res crazy speed A93, which one is going to suit your needs? And it also raises a question of being able to read all of that data off in one flash, of course, gets you know exponentially more difficult as you go to higher resolutions. So what are we going to be looking at in terms of price when this does come to 36, 48, 50 and beyond megapixels? It's all just going to be a matter of time in the years let to follow when Canon and Sony and sorry, Canon and Nikon and whoever else follow in Sony's footsteps and it becomes more mainstream then we'll see the prices drop. But I think it's fair to point out that at 24 megapixel with all of the great things that it's doing, if you isolate the fact that it's a global shutter and just look at what video it does, what card format it has, uh, what or, you know the other specifications, it's not too different from like an A7 IV, but with the viewfinder from the higher level cameras and dual CF Express Type A's. So it looks like we're paying four, five thousand dollars just for that global shutter, and I don't know the dynamic range of it yet. And of course, that four or $5,000 is buying you a cutting edge latest generation uh, global shutter sensor that does enable 120 frame per second and flicker free and syncing at any speed. 
just you have to think about when are you going to use that? What's the application going to be realistically in your workflow? And if you just have the money and you think it'd be fun to play with, then great, we need early adopters to do this stuff so then the development costs are recouped and future generations of camera will get access to this sensor or ones like it at a much lower price point that will make it less of a niche product, especially as we can get the resolution building up again in years to come. So going back to where I started, this is a line in the sand. Global Shutter is here. Of course it was Sony, the innovators, the pioneers, the early adopters who have brought this to us. They did it with the NEX cameras, bringing mirrorless to the masses. Now they're bringing Global Shutter. They're leading the way. This is going to be a seismic shift in the mirrorless market. When we look back in five or 10 years time, this will be a really important release. I just think it's important as a milestone rather than being a camera that's actually going to appeal or make sense for a huge number of photographers. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Links to the different things I've talked about in this are below. Cheers and fingers crossed one day I'll be back in the good graces of Sony and able to bring this stuff hands on with the other reviewers rather than having it announced whilst I'm asleep and doing it in the middle of a messy desk. Cheers guys.